It's a great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Hito Steyrl. Hito Steyrl lives and works in Berlin. Steyrl's prolific filmmaking and writing occupies a highly discursive position between the fields of art, philosophy, and politics, constituting a deep exploration of late capitalism's social, cultural, and financial imaginaries. Her films and lectures have increasingly addressed the presentational context of art, while her writing has circulated widely through, publish through publication in both academic and art journals, often online. She has had solo exhibitions at the Museum of Contemporary Art Los Angeles, uh, Reina Sofia Madrid, Van Abbe Museum Eindhoven, among many others. Her group exhibitions include the Venice Biennale in 2015 and 13, Museum of Modern Art New York and Documenta 12 Castle. Join me in welcoming Hito Steyrl. Thank you, Brian. And thanks for having me, and thanks for being here. So, I will show you a video which I was also shown about a year ago when I went to Ukraine to make a work. And I will just simply show it to you and talk over it. Maybe we can have the sound? Yeah, that's it. So I was very puzzled because I didn't really understand what was going on. But the thing is, this is obviously a tank, and it's an old tank uh, from World War II. It's from a series called Josip Stalin III. And very obviously, it's being started up, with, meaning that the people who are climbing inside now are trying to bring it back to life somehow. And the thing which I noticed last, that it is actually standing on a pedestal. So it's a part of a historical display. And the video simply breaks off after a while, so we don't really know uh, how the story ends, but uh, we <laughs> learned about the end of the story through a newspaper report. I cannot really confirm whether it's true or not, but the newspaper report said that basically the tank drove off the pedestal, immediately went to war, attacked a checkpoint in Ulyanovka uh, district, resulting in three dead and three wounded on the Ukrainian side and no losses on our side. So I thought this was quite fascinating in relation of you know thinking about what a museum is because one could potentially think that the active role of a tank would be over once it becomes part of a historical display. But this specific pedestal seems to have acted just as a sort of temporary storage place from which the tank could be redeployed directly into battle, which means that the way into the museum or even into history itself seems not to be a one-way street. So is the museum then, is it a garage? <laughs> or is it an arsenal? Is the pedestal of this monument, can we say, can we call it a military base? So I think this opens up uh, way more general questions because how can one think then of art institution in an age that is defined by planetary civil war, on the un one hand growing inequality, but also proprietary digital technology. This also, of course, affects the institution because its boundary have become fuzzy and porous. And I'm just dreaming of the age in which a museum will basically read people's um, eye movements, track people's eye movements, and just show them the art that the museum, you know, think they want to see. I have already designed a MA, you know, to, to teach this kind of curating. I call it neuro-curating, 
you know. Neuro-orienting paintings will surveil their audience via facial recognition and eye tracking to check whether the paintings are popular enough or whether anyone is behaving suspiciously. So is it possible in this situation to update the 20 century terminology of institutional critique or what kind of models are there available? What kind of prototypes? What is a model anyway? In this case, the model is a Josip Stalin III. How does it link? How does the idea of the model, the notion, the term of the model, how does it link on and off screen realities? How does it link mathematics and aesthetics, future and past, reason and treason? And what is the role of the model in a global chain of projection as production. In this example, I think, of the kidnap tank, history invades the hyper-contemporary. It is not an account of events after the fact. It acts, it is active, it feigns, it keeps on changing. It's a shape-shifting player, if not an irregular combatant. It keeps attacking from behind, and it blocks off any kind of future. Frankly, this kind of history sucks. <laughs> so this history is not a noble endeavor, something to be studied in the name of humankind, so as to avoid uh, being repeated. On the contrary, this kind of history is partial. It's partisan, it's even privatized, it's a self-interested enterprise, a means to feel entitled, an objective obstacle to coexistence and a temporal fog detaining people in the stranglehold of imaginary origins. The tradition of the oppressed that Benjamin conjured turns into a phalanx of oppressive traditions. So, thinking about this tank which went from the pedestal to the battlefield, and actually uh, it went back again, you know, <laughs> not on the same pedestal, but actually it ended up being captured in battle by Ukrainian forces who brought it back to Kiev and stored it into another museum, and you can already imagine how this will be deployed maybe again. So anyhow, if the tank is driving in, circle, in, in circles, is Time itself may be running backwards nowadays. Did someone remove its forward gear and force it you know, into a loop? And the form of the loop is also what history seems to have acquired these days. It seems to have morphed into a loop. In this situation, of course, it's tempting to rehash Marx's idea of the historical repetition as farce, and he thought, of course, that historical repetition could produce ludicrous results. However, I feel that this quote in specifically, uh, specifically sometimes has already obtained the status of farce, so I will <laughs> refrain quoting it. Instead, I would like to suggest quoting someone else, namely Tom Cruise and Emily Blunt. And I think this is much more helpful for the topic at hand. This is a really interesting film. You should watch it. It's, it's, it's quite, quite inspiring. It's called Edge of Tomorrow. And in this film, the uh, Earth has been invaded by a strange alien species called the Mimics. And to get rid of them, those two guys, Blunt and Cruz, they get themselves stuck in a sort of time-looped battle. They have to live through the same day over and over again, and they get killed over and over again by those mimics who are you know, vastly superior. And then they respawn, basically, to live another day, another life, another day. And they have to find a way out of this loop. The interesting thing is, if you look at this poster, where does the main, where does the villain, where do the villains live, those mimics, the aliens? And you see, they live inside the Louvre. 
they live underneath the Louvre, to be uh, very precise. And underneath the Louvre py Pyramid, you know, by IMP, this famous building. And this is where Blunt and Cruz go to destroy the mimics. So in this film, the enemy is basically inside the museum, or more accurately, it is underneath the museum. The mimics have hijacked the place. They turned time into a loop. So what does the form of the loop mean, and how is it related to warfare? And uh, Giorgio Agamben has recently written a small treatise. He analyzed the Greek term stasis, which I thought just means basically stagnation, immutability, something which doesn't change. But then Agamben uh, at least suggest that it could also mean something completely different, namely civil war. That's quite, kind of interesting because um, today there is a lot of conflicts which display this kind of double paradoxical character. Uh, they seem to be mired in stasis in both senses of the world's word. Because on the one hand, stasis describes a civil war that is unresolved and drags on. So it is both extremely dynamic because it's a war, but then it's also extremely permanent because it's never ever solved. Conflict is not a means to force a resolution of a disputed situation, but a tool to sustain this situation. A stagnant crisis is the point. It needs to be indefinite because it is an abundant source of profit and of opportunity. Instability is a gold mine that never runs out. And stasis, this is also something Agamben found out, it happens as a transition between the private and public spheres. It is a very convenient mechanism for a one-way redistribution of assets. Public mm, possessions are privatized by means of violence, while formerly private hatreds become the new public spirit. And the current version of Stasis is set in an age of cutting-edge non-conventional warfare. Con contemporary conflicts are fought by uber militias, by bank-sponsored bot armies, and Kickstarter-funded toy drones. Their protagonists wear game gear, extreme sports gadgets, and they coordinate with vice reporters via WhatsApp. The, the, this is all, I mean, real existing examples. The result is a patchwork form of conflict that uses pipelines, 3Gs as weapons within widespread proxy stalemates. A permanent, the present, perma war is fought, for example, by historical battle reenactors in the case of these conflicts, actually on both sides of the conflicts, which one could as well call real life mimics. Stasis is the form of time uh, in, in a loop in the context of permanent war and privatization. The museum leaks the past into the present. The museum stops containing the past, right? If tanks can just escape and go to war, then the museum has in that sense failed to contain history. And history, as a result, becomes severely corrupted and limited. There's another interesting fiction film, which is called Children of Men by Alfonso Cuaron. And there is another you know, museum which plays an interesting role in this um, movie, uh, and not, presents another way of how institutions might react to planetary civil war. The film presents a sort of dystopian future in the UK where actually there are several uh, zones, one zone which is complete nightmare, mired in civil war, inhabited by refugees. Then, then there is a semi-safe zone. Both are extremely separated from one another. And this is a kind of special zone, actually, 
located inside Tate Modern. Uh, upstairs from the turbine hall, there is in the film, of course, this kind of um, setting, where which is called the Ark of the Arts. The Art of the Arts preserves the art world, uh, artworks from around the world, the treasures of art history, and so on. You see, there is David, and he has already lost a leg, but uh, he's kind of being preserved within this safe haven of the Ark of the arts. So basically, it, the, the film asks a very relevant question, wouldn't it be great you know, to have this kind of institution, especially at a time where so many cultural treasures are being destroyed through warfare? Uh, wouldn't it be great to have this kind of arc of the arts for the antiquities of Palmyra or Nineveh and so on? However, and that's also interesting, this Arc of the Arts is a quite strange institution because basically it has no public. And I really love this still from another scene which shows Guernica, of course, Picasso's Guernica, being used as a backdrop for basically a private dining room. And so the Arc of the Arts is a very safe institution. It's extremely secure. All these artworks are, you know, they, they are being s properly stored and preserved, but almost no one is able to see them. So it's basically just the director of the institution, um, his son, and the servants. That's, that's uh, all there is. And also in the film, humanity is said to... Um, they, they cannot reproduce anymore, so basically it's bound to be exterminated. Um, yes, but I also thought, so seeing this scene, I also thought of a different paradigm of contemporary art display, which is the international Freeport art storage, where artworks equally disappear into the invisibility of tax-free storage cubes. So these are basically storages, art storages located in tax havens or transit zones mainly, or zones with reduced um, tax um, authority. So they are being stored there to avoid taxation mainly, but also because these places are supposed to be safe. And I think that except from the, you know, now quite traditional form of the international biennial, the duty-free art storage is probably the most important contemporary active form for art. It is certainly the only one, the only new one that the 21st century has come up with. It's like the dystopian backside of the biennial at a time when liberal dreams of globalization and cosmopolitanism have been realized as a multipolar mess peopled with oligarchs, warlords, too big to fail, corporations, autocrats, and a lot of newly stateless people. And it's interesting how those early 21st century descriptions of globalization have somehow been realized, but in a very dark way, for example, at that time, which is not very long ago, not even 15 years ago, globalization was described as a, you know, a bright formula. It was the value of civil society multiplied by the internet, divided by migration, metropolitan urbanism, the power of NGOs, and other forms of transnational political organization. And at that time, of course, the internet was also still in a different condition. It was uh, seen as a kind of hopeful technology, and this was long ago. The interesting thing is that those organi organizational forms pioneered by NGOs and, for example, liberal women's rights campaigns are now being deployed by oligarch-funded fascist battalions, by go pro jihadi units by people you know playing forex exchanges in para statelets with unclear international status within anti-terrorist operation zones 
And all these you know, new spatial configurations emerge alongside duty-free zones, offshore entities, and corporate proxy concessions. And at the same time, the internet basically turns into a network for global fiber optic surveillance. The planetary civil war is fought by engaging with the logistic disruptions of planetary computerization. And of course, the cosmopolitans uh, invoked only 15 years ago, at this point in time, do not fail to promptly engage in civil warfare whenever the chance presents itself. Every digital tool available is uh, put to work, whether it's bot armies, Twitter trolls, Western Union signal PowerPoint presentations, jihadi forum gamification, this is something that exists, is whatever works. Stasis acts as a mechanism that converts the cosmo of cosmopolitan into corporate and the polis into property. So cosmopolitan becomes corporate property. The corresponding institutional model is the Freeport art storage, which is built on tax exempt status and tactical extra territoriality. And Children of Men shows, shows how this could become basically a template for formerly public institutions amidst the effects of planetary civil war, which means that the artworks are secured to the point of becoming completely invisible. So the International Biennial was the active form of art for the late 20th century for these ideas of globalization. But now, duty-free art storage and you know, terror-proof, hyper-secure bunkers are its equivalent, actually, you know, also tower mansions, for example, are its equivalent in the age of globalizing stasis and pop-up NATO fence borders. On the other hand, this is not really a necessary reaction to war. One might be tempted to say, yeah, you know, whenever things get dangerous, then artworks need to be withdrawn, secured, protected, and so on. But this is an example how the same painting which you saw here, I mean, this is of course a replica, is being displayed during another planetary civil war, and this is in 1937 at the Spanish Republic's pavilion at the World Expo in Paris. This is the Spanish pavilion, and the painting you see basically outside, hung outside, this is Guernica. This is how this was displayed to show the results of airstrikes on a civilian population. And in terms of conservation, this was a kind of very lousy decision. I think the painting still suffers from that. But anyhow, it, you, it was hung outdoors for a couple of months. So in the future, which is projected by children of men, Picasso's painting is safe. It's certainly, you know, air conditioned and, you know, climate controlled and so on. It might be safe, but very few people will see it. But in the historical civil war, basically the complete opposite decision was taken and it was literally exposed in a very, very literal sense. It was put out there. And this is also what the word exposition means, you know, it's like putting it out there. And in terms of conservation, the scenario of children of man is contradictory because the first thing that probably needs to be conserved or preserved is not even the artwork, but a situation in which it can be seen and accessed because otherwise there is in a way not really a point preserving it if it cannot be seen at all. So more than the artworks themselves, the thing that's under threat is basically um, public access, which makes art what it is in the first place, thus you know, necessitating its conservation. 
So therefore, there's the contradiction. Art requires access to be what it is, but yet its visib visibility is precisely threatened by efforts to preserve or privatize it. Of course, there's something strange because, you know, previously I said one should not repeat history and this always turns out to be a farce and now I'm showing you this Spanish pavilion from 1937, so there is something wrong, I think. But I would like to come back actually to the poster of the film I showed you before, The Edge of Tomorrow, because I think that in this movie there is a solution to this problem, to the problem of the loop. It offers an unexpected answer to the problem of stasis, to escaping from you know, this eternal loop. The movie is based on a novel which is called All You Need Is Kill by Sakurazaka Hiroshi, and he built a narrative out of the experience of hitting the reset button in a video game. So basically, it's no coincidence that the whole movie has the structure of a video game, and you are stuck on one level, and you cannot beat the level. And basically, you keep on dying, and the same day keeps on repeating because you are stuck on this bloody level. But on the other hand, this is what gamers are used to solve, right? And it's not really uh, rocket science. You just go online and figure out you know, how to do it, because there is always some weapon being hidden in some kind of cupboard or underneath a floor or something, and then you just use it and you beat the level, because it's, this is the point, go to the next level. It's not about reenacting something, that's not the point. It's basically escaping the loop. There is no pleasure in repeating the same thing over and over again. There is, in most games, at least an exit for every level, each repeated sentence and each loop. And this movie, which has the structure of a video game, essentially, Edge of Tomorrow, not only maintains that there is a tomorrow, that we are already positioned at its edge. It is possible to complete the level. It is possible to break free from this loop. So, what does all of this mean for the museum? One could say that, first of all, history only exists if there is a tomorrow, if there is a future, that is, if the tanks remain locked up within the historical collection and time is able to move on because it's not constantly being recaptured into the loop. In this sense, you know, harking back to Walid's presentation, one could say that the museum is really a form of quarantine also. Anything, you know, that's too beautiful to be true or otherwise dangerous, you just lock it up in a museum and solve the problem. So the future only happens if history doesn't invade and occupy the present, the museum must basically render the tank useless. Um, I was actually told after giving this talk previously that you cannot render a tank useless. It's militarily impossible. So either you just, you know, completely scrap it, but the tank cannot physically be rendered useless. So at least it has to be contained within the museum. Because otherwise the museum becomes an instrument for prolonging stasis by preserving the tyranny of a partial and partisan history, which also turns out to be a great business opportunity. So what does this have to do with the Spanish pavilion? Because I said this is going to solve uh, you know, the problem of the Spanish pavilion. There's one detail which I didn't mention when I was showing the slide, but it's quite obvious, because at that time, uh, all the works were new inside the pavilion. In 1937, they were all newly commissioned, not only artworks, also educational displays, all sorts of different things to go into that pavilion. And the curators didn't you know, pick historical works, even though you know, Goya's Desastres de la Guerra would have made perfect sense, but they didn't do it. They commissioned new pieces, um, and to reactivate that model, or to be, you know, to, to, 
to, to try to, let's say, apply it. You know, we were talking about repeating, resurrecting, and so on. So this is not what I mean. To apply it, basically, one needs to do the same. It needs to be on the next level. You cannot repeat the same with new works in the present. So, of course, you know, if you take this seriously, this will be a huge endeavor which goes far. You know, the production of a couple uh, new artworks, it basically enters into the project of not only recreating the city, but the whole of society. And then one can, could also start to experiment, you know, with play and games and rules and actualizing rules, creating rules that change or stay the same or become, you know, evolve from the form of the loop into an open, you know, form of play. Let me summarize. This is the end of the talk. So what... What, 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 what is the deal with all these ideas about museums, history, planetary civil war, and so on? History only exists if there is a tomorrow, and conversely, a future only exists if the past is preserved, but not only preserved, but also preserved from permanently leaking into the present and contaminating it, so to speak and if mimics of all sorts are defeated, which means that museums have less to do with the past than with the future. Conservation is less about preserving the past than it is about creating the future, future of public spaces, future of art, and future as such. Thank you. Suppose to take questions. <laughs> okay, I think there is a question. Um, yes, maybe there's a question. In the We've got a, question. Yeah. I've got a question. Is so. Hi, uh, thank you for your. I'm over here. Where, where Hi, you? how's it going? Ah, okay. Yeah. Hi, so uh -huh. thanks for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, I wonder if you could maybe help me understand the way you're thinking about access. That's a term that you used a few times. Um, and then you presented these, a couple of different examples. The tank is one. But I'm really curious about comparing uh, the Picasso painting in the Spanish pavilion to the, which is to me like a actual action, it's a gesture. Uh, comparing that to it as a representation in Children of Men um, because to me, access works super differently there, and if we're just quantifying it, probably more people saw the representation in the film just because of the distribution networks of film. And so uh, I really like the way that you sort of brought it all together to talk about museums being about the future, but I'm curious about this question of access. Like, what are you mm -hmm. arguing for is the access? Because it partially mm -hmm. felt like you were privileging the object, mm -hmm. um, which is fine, but mm -hmm. I was, I'm just kind of trying to understand what you mean when you're talking about access and the way that you're using it in this mm -hmm. talk. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, that, that's of course, we, we, we enter a long discussion here about the reproduction, circulation of the reproduction, and so on and so on. So I'm, I don't have any preferences. I'm not saying you need to see the real thing, otherwise you miss, miss it all. That's not what I'm saying. I think other people could legitimately make that argument, but I, I can't. Uh, actually, it's really interesting. I have some other slides in this presentation which show other stages of Guernica being displayed. After it returned from the States, um, it was shown at the Prado in a, in a amazing installation which consisted of a sort of vast prism of bulletproof glass and there were two armed guards standing next to it all the time because and you know this is, was a legitimate um, um, fear that the painting itself would be attacked right this is after Franco dies so the painting is seen as being endangered and it needs to be basically fortified in order to withstand um, these potential attacks. And then now at the end they are having a sort of contest with themselves 
to, they are treating it very um, casually, which means that they are trying to bring down any kind of barrier successively, successively. So if you look at installation shots, then you will see that at one point there is a rope, you know, and then the rope disappears. There's just a line on the floor. Now there is not even a line on the floor anymore, but there is, of course, at the entrance, you have to put your luggage through a scanner, like at the airport. So basically, there's all these kinds of level of security being involved, and I'm fascinated how, you know, with this specific painting, um, the security levels have changed over time, and they reflect history. Now, in terms of access, I think the thing is, uh, I'm. I was trying to point out, you know, rather than just a question of visibility or physical access, is the type of institutions that have now almost mushroomed, I would say, to privatize paintings and prevent access in a way, or to withdraw them into these kind of, you know, fortified bunkers. I was you know, yesterday I reread this text and I thought, yeah, these are the real safe spaces of today, right? It's these kind of freeport art storage cubicles where paintings are uh, basically inside their crates and in theory they are not leaving their crates at all. If they get sold, they just get transferred to the next cubicle and you can can spend centuries, you know, just circulating the painting inside the crate from one cubicle into another, which is also a quite interesting art history than, you know, art history of invisibility. But I think that, uh, so this was what I was trying to point out, the recent creation of all these extreme safe bunker-like um, tax-free spaces for art, which create, in my view, a very contemporary paradigm of visibility slash invisibility. And I think, you know, rather than the question of physical access, it's about the new function and role that artworks have, you know, in, in this, these kind of spaces. They become a reserve currency, basically. They start taking on the role of financial in instruments more than anything else. It's a different stage. Um, thank you very much for your yeah. presentation and the beautiful poetics of some of your languages and phrases. Um, I've got a question though. You, you set up this idea of there being uh, the levels that you want, you have to be to come to the next, uh, that you want to get to the next level two of uh, and I'm wondering where you see within institutions the sort of secret art within the art institution, the secret tools and the and the the uh, the knowledge that you need that it, to 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 push art forward, especially with what you're talking about in terms of the the crisis of uh, global surveillance. <laughs> I mean, you've obviously thought so deeply on the subject. <laughs> No, I mean, well, I, I think there's probably, uh, I'm going to be very optimistic, okay? So I think I'm going to just pretend there is at least 100 answers to this question. <laughs> Maybe there is none, but let's pretend there is at least 100. Um, I think, right now, I think it would be interesting if art institutions would consider themselves even as something like cities, you know? What would happen if an art institution would have to function like a city? If they had to develop their own economy, internal economy, how would that work? It's really a thought experiment, but, you know, if one would try advancing that, that might create interesting, you know, perspectives. Yeah, there's one more question. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I'd like to hear you speak a little more on issues of return and repetition, because uh, I'm sympathetic to 
the, the need to avoid this time loop model. But I think also with this, uh, the future-oriented model that you're speaking of, the danger implicit in that is that mm -hmm. we just fall into this forward-marching modernity, sacrificing everything else to this notion of progress. Um, and since there's been some discussion of Walter Benjamin today, I think of his theses on history and his discussions of how the past can present itself into the present against the agencies of the present and actually affect a historical consciousness that was impossible to grasp in the past's own time and also impossible to grasp if, uh, if, um, if we're just focused on this, uh, this future-oriented model. So could you speak, is it possible that the past can leak into the present into generative ways as well? Possible, yes. <laughs> <laughs> No, definitely possible. But I think right now, past also, I mean, it has always been fragmented, right? It was never unified. There was never like one past. But now there is so many comp competing, like small singularities, meaning past that are basically not compatible with one another, that have completely different frameworks, which follow different rules or no rules, and that cannot no longer be, that are not common commensurable to one another. And these past basically proliferate, I mean, really, in the sense of uh, weapons of mass destruction, proliferation. So that that's something I see. I definitely think it could be different. But um, right now, you know, I mean, I'm quoting the Spanish pavilion and trying to, you know, de derive a historical model, which is not historical from it, but invoking it, definitely. So maybe it's more about, you know, how to do it, how to do the repetition or, in, as other people said, resurrection. Actually, I have a question for everyone. <laughs> There's something I was asking myself today because we were talking about resurrection so many times and immortality. And I and also vampires in Walid's talk. And I kept thinking, oh my god, there is the reflection of one person missing in the mirror when we are talking about these things. And if we were coming, if we were going to come into the same space with the mirror on the wall in 5,000 years from now, whose reflection would we see? You know, because the vampire's reflection is delayed. And I... Unfortunately, I have an answer to this question. We would see Peter Thiel's reflection in the mirror. Why is this? This is the person within Silicon Valley who has extensively you know, researched immortality, cryogenics, also vampiric technologies of you know, staying young, because he's the person that you know, uh, has figured out that uh, injecting the blood of young people keeps people young. So I think it's a very, it's almost a prototypical, vampirical theory. So just imagine, you know, I mean, these technologies might now become, um, well, backed up with a tremendous, you know, power structure. I mean, he's a member of the a uh, transitional team of the president-elect. So I wonder, you know, what are these technologies of resurrection and of vampiric um, preservation, conservation, or rejuvenation? Is there another version which we have failed, you know, to foresee? Is there, you know, a very... Yeah, alternative. I will very, very cautiously call it an alternative vision of this kind of resurrection. What kind of resurrection technologies will we be faced from now on? No, but this was a question, actually. <laughs> So now you know how people feel when they are being asked this you know, vast, vast and unanswerable questions. Okay. okay, well, thank you.